here this morning. I was thinking of my time coming in the Flagstaff the, the first time. It's been about, I guess, around 38 years ago, or maybe 40. And I was uh, talking about getting up the hill. There was no snow, but my little Model T could hardly get up the hill. Uh, it could go 30 miles an hour, but that's 15 this way and 15 this way, you know, or some of these roads we had here, and it was quite a... Why don't you give us that Ford? Ford. <laughs> Brother Clark, <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, telling me about a little poem I had one time of, on my Ford. It's not a good place to give it. <laughs> so uh, we're very grateful, and I've had so many uh, nice testimonies this morning here from these brethren. Met some of the men, and there was... Uh, this uh, minister that just spoke here, a little Spanish brother that gave his, uh, the little boys the time to sing. Wasn't that wonderful for a six-year-old voice? Wow. Uh, the nicest little voice I ever heard for a little boy like that. Now, this brother, the brother forgot it, but he's holding a meeting here in your city. I think it's down at the Church of God or Assemblies of, uh, Assemblies of God. Down at the Assemblies of God. And... Uh, I'm sure they would appreciate your, your presence. If, if, how long is the meeting lasting, brother? Sunday. Sunday Through Sunday. Night. Through Sunday night. We're having a inspiration tonight. Sir? We're having a inspiration tonight. Inspiration tonight. Now, you're all cordially invited to come to this meeting. 730. at 7.30. 7.30 tonight. And uh, where is the church located, brother? Would you just tell us where? 113 West Clay. 113 West Clay Street, right here in the city of Flagstaff. And... Um, and I'm sure you is a little boy with you. No. Uh, well, his daddy will sing. <laughs> Are you saying to me? Well, that's fine. I hit that just right, rolling time. Uh, that's very. Some of you see that, but it's a usually it's just one talent in the family. It takes from the rest of it. But I suppose they have. It all started out in fasting and prayer, brother. Fasting and praying. Now that's that's really nice. I, you know, if America had all together of all of our American families is like that. Well, they just dismiss all the police force. Millennium would be on. We'd be, be right in first class then. That's right. All death would fade away, all sickness, sorrow, all disappointments, and we would be with Christ. Amen. So we're happy. And I hear all these fine testimonies and had the privilege of meeting Brother Earl for my first time. And, and last evening I was talking to his wife, and, and she's been called out and healed several times in the meeting. He said the last meeting she's on the platform. So, make this little, kind of a little sense of humor. I didn't remember Brother Earl, though I'd shut his hand somewhere. And, um, and I sat at the window last night looking for him to come up, and a gray, tall man come up with wearing a black mustache. I said, here he comes. <laughs> and then when it, Billy, my son, said, oh, no, I said, that's not Brother Earl. He's much younger than that boy. And so on. And um, I got to meet our sister Earl here last evening and has had the privilege of being in their lovely home here in, in the city. This is a nice place. I always want to call it Flagpole instead of Flagstaff, <laughs> way up on top of the hill here. <laughs> and uh, I tell you, if there's anybody here from Texas, now you brag. <laughs> I left Tucson yesterday about 72 or 75, somewhere along there, and up here this morning with an overcoat on. See, what they got in Texas, we got in Arizona, haven't we? That's right. <laughs> We're right here. In this time of fellowship, old Dr. Bosworth, a friend of mine, many of you might have known Brother Bosworth. He's one of the saintless old men. And um, he said to me one time, he said, Brother Brandon, you know what fellowship is? I said, I think so, Brother Bosworth. He said, it's two fellows in one ship. <laughs> so they have to share a little bit. So that's what fellowship is. We take and give, share with each other. With Brother Carl Williams, all the rest, Brother Outlaw, all, one of the first people in Arizona that ever sponsored one of my meetings was, was Brother Jimmy Outlaw. And we've been bosom brothers since that time. And we are very happy for all of you, for the ministers and the brethren that we meet around here. I don't have time to shake hands with everybody. I, was, I like to, but it's a fellowship where we get together. It just reminds me of, of the Phoenix Convention I've had the privilege since the chapters first started to, to help organize the chapters and speak in them. And it's the only organization I belong to. And it's not an organization. It's just an organism working among the people. And if some of you a man here this morning that 
that doesn't uh, belong to this uh, fellowship of this Christian businessman, full gospel, uh, let, if you believe, and will take my word, it's one of the finest groups of people, and, and to the minister brothers, it's not against your church, it's for your church. See, it's their way of placing in to the, to the church. I just happened to look around at this lovely lady here that just sang that song a few moments ago. I've heard many attempts of it, but that lady had a voice get carried right, you know, without squeaking it like, I, I like that so much, lady. It was Amen. very, very fine. Says the minister's wife here. And, uh, brother, you ought to have her sing you to sleep each night. <laughs> so that would be very, very fine. It's very fine singing. I appreciate it. And this morning, it kind of reminds me of a little, a little story that I, I like to hunt and fish. That's one of the reasons I'm here in Arizona, so is uh, getting hunting and fishing, and I like it. And so I was fishing one time in New Hampshire, and I guess I got a lot of partners in here that like to fish, both in the male and female, too. They, we all like it. So I had a little pup tent I'd packed way high above where, you know, the fellows, kind of a little heavy or something, could walk up there. And there's many fine of those uh, brook trout, brown square tail, cutthroat, all oh, they just full of them little tributaries coming down out of the top of the mountains in New Hampshire. And a little trout, maybe 14, 16 inches long, just many of them. And I'd only, I'd go over there and catch them just for the fun of catch them, turn them loose. If I kill one, then I, I eat that when you see, bring them in. So I had a, some of this old moose willow growing up. And, and every time I'd switch my fly line, I had a little royal coachman that'd fly back in there with it. I'd switch it around a, a bunch of moose willow. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to take a hatchet and go up there this morning and, and chop that moose willow down so that I won't catch my line on it. Oh, I looked back under a little, old, like a beaver dam, and they were just laying in there, just waiting for that coachman to get on there. And I, all night long, I used to say I got my hair, but I, I ain't got enough hair for me to get into now. So I, I just, just how they, how they would watch him. And so I got up there that morning, took this little old hatchet and cut down this moose bull. And I had three or fours go to fix for breakfast and come back. And I'm not a very good cook, you know? so. Um, I told my wife I couldn't boil water without scorching it, so you know that'd be a pretty bad job of cooking. So on the road back, there'd been an old mother bear and two cubs, and they'd got my little tent. And you talk about rim wrecking something. You don't know how things can be rim wrecked till you let a bear get in the tent. It, they, it's not what they destroy, what they eat, I mean, it's what they destroy. I had a little stove, a little sheep herder stove in there. and. Um, They'd get on this little stove and just jump up and down. You hear the pipe rattle and just mash it to pieces, you know. And when I come up, I had a little old rusty 22 rifle laying in there, but I had a, this axe in my hand. And, you know, when I come up, the old mother uh, run off to one side and she cooed to her cubs. One cub followed along all right, but the other one said, little bitty fella, and may, you know, just come out. Here he's back old humped up to me like that. And I thought, what's he doing? Well, and she looked over at me, and I looked for a tree to see just how, how close to us, because they can scratch, you know, about them young ones, and they, you can't talk them out of it. So um, I uh, watched the old mother a little while, you know. She kept cooing, making noise, something like a bird. You'd have to know what one sound like. So she kept cooing that cub, and that cub wouldn't come. Well, I thought about my rifle, and... I thought, no, if I run in there and grab that rifle, if I'd shoot the old mother, leave two orphans in the woods, I didn't want to be guilty of that. And besides her charge in that 22 would be kind of small, you know, and sometimes didn't it didn't go off. I snap it three or four times to make it go off. So I thought, well, I'll just get in that tree there. If she starts over here, I'll get up there in a the tree, get me a little switch and just flip them across the nose. Her nose is very tender, and they just squeal and go down, you know, and they leave you alone. So I thought I'd get in that tree, but the curiosity of that little fellow all sitting up like this. And I thought, what's he doing? So I kept slipping around watching her, you know, get a little farther away and get close to the tree. Because she kept cooing to that cub. So I got over a little further, and you know what that little fellow had done? Now, I like flapjacks, or pancakes, I believe you call them out here. Down south, we call them flapjacks. I'm not very good at making them, but I'm sure good at eating them. And, uh, you know, I was a Baptist. I don't like to sprinkle. I really like to baptize them, really put the glasses to them. So... I had me a can of molasses about this high sitting there, a little half-gallon bucket for my flapjacks. And that little fellow, you know, a bear likes sweet anyhow, he'd got that bucket of molasses open. 
And he was sitting there with a little paw about that wide and head up in his arms. He's just socking his little foot down and licking like I should. Just right. And he he'd lick that little tongue. And I started, hey, if he just had a camera, I'd love to show that this morning just to look at it. And there he was putting his little foot down there and licking like that. And I hollered, get away from there. Like that. And he didn't pay any attention to me. He just kept licking like that. He stopped that bucket out. See? And I hollered at him like that. He turned around and looked at me like that. He couldn't get his eyes open. He's just so full of molasses. You know, all over his eyes, his little belly. Just as full of molasses as he could be. And then after a while, he staggered off sideways and rode to his mother. They got him up there in the bushes and started licking him. <laughs> they were afraid to set the bucket, but they could lick him. And I said, if that isn't a type of a good old Pentecostal meeting, just get so full of good sweet stuff, he'd got somebody lick off of it. <laughs> That's a real fellowship meeting. Now we just come like this to get our hands in the bucket, each one of us, plumb up to the elbow of God's blessings. And I'm sure you'll find that at the revival that's being down at the Assemblies of God going on down there now. The Lord bless you. I said in Phoenix the other day, a little, I hope it didn't sound sacrilegious, about a little joke about a minister that would go at the platform every morning. And for 20 years solid, he preached 20 minutes, then be done. And so they couldn't understand why it was. And um, so one morning he preached about four hours. And the, the deacons called him back and said, Pastor, we really love you. Said, we, we think your messages are wonderful. And said, we know as a deacon board, we've watched you in times you had exactly 20 minutes every Sunday morning. And said, this morning was four hours. Said, we just don't understand. Said, I'll tell you, brother. He said, every morning when I go to preach, said, when you call me to the platform, I reach in and put one of these lifesavers under my tongue. And said, in 20 minutes, when that lifesaver is gone, said, I, I, I'm finished. He said, I know it's time to quit. And said, what was a mistake this morning? I got a button. <laughs> 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 Carl Williams, Jewel Rose, Rio bosom brothers and friends of mine, they went downtown of the day and got a button about that big <laughs> to give me, and <laughs> but I haven't got it this morning. <laughs> so we're, we're grateful to be here. Now, does anyone in here know Dr. Lee Vale? I don't think so, uh, maybe not. He is a Baptist preacher, Doctor of Divinity, and he's got his degrees. He was a high school teacher to begin with, and he's a very fine scholarly man. In my tapes of the seven church ages, I sent them to him to grammarize them because my old Kentucky hit, haint, and tote, and carry, and fetch, that don't go good for people who read some books. So he was going to grammarize it for me. And then after he got through, sent it back a couple times for more statements, which the book is going to press now after about three, four years. He asked me, he said, can I write a book? Uh, just uh, my comments, and I said, well, it's all right, Brother Lee. And um, I thought, and then he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, it, not to be sold, given away. I said, well, I, I'm sure that's all right, see. And so they had a sponsorship of about 10 people to sponsor it, which cost them about $1,500, I think, I understand, for 10,000 of them. And um, so we, uh, we got them. They all come off the press a couple days ago, and we got... It's two or three yesterday, and Billy brought them up, and they're, they're given away. Now, I've never read it. I don't know what he said, but I'm, this is by faith. <laughs> but I'm sure if you'd like to have one, if you just write us, it'd be sent to you free. And um, it's called 20th Century Prophet. And then I noticed in the picture here in the front of the book, many of you have got this picture, of course, and seen it. That's where the angel of the Lord was taken at Houston, Texas. But they cut part of it off. Then I see here in the back... And how many here has ever been in one of the meetings? Let's see. I guess practically all of you have. You hear me say many times, uh, that shadow hanging over someone. Now, see, if you make a statement, and it isn't the truth, God won't have anything to do with it. You know God is not associated in lies. But he only backs up what's truth. So when he told Moses, when he met him back there in the wilderness, in the pillar of fire, back in that burning bush... And when he brought those people out and those who would follow Moses out for the journey, then he came down upon Mount Sinai, that same pillar of fire, and vindicated that what Moses had said was the truth. Now, God will do that. He always does that. So this light here, of course, we associate it with God because it has the same nature and everything that 
he did when he was here on earth. Then on that saying, this person here, I see you're shadowed to death. Dark shadow. How many, many of you have heard that said? Well, here just recently in a meeting, there's somebody curious, wanted to see if they could get a picture of that when it was said. So they, um, there's a lady sitting close, and this man had a camera. And I said, this lady sitting here is Mrs. So-and-so, whatever it is. And I said, she's shattered to death because she's got cancer. And just then, he snapped the picture because it was closed. And there it was. See? That hooded black cancer of death hanging over the woman. And then the Holy Spirit spoke back again. Now, when they put this in the book, they had it cut off. So they just put this in here just to the, make another printing of the book. And uh, that's why you'll see that loose leaf in there. I think the um, voice of healing was the one who printed the book. And now it's absolutely free. And the sponsor is back here in the back of the book who put $1,500 in it just to get it out to the public, let the public read it. So uh, it's free. And it's a nice little book. And it, I don't know what the contents is. I've never read it. The Father knows that. But uh, see, it was to me, it's an uh, absolute truth. Well, that's what we look for is truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. And he is that truth. He is Jesus, the Son of God, is the truth of the Word because he was the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God. And the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Then that made him the truth because the Word is the truth, and he was the truth. Now when we see him return in these last days, this great move of God moving across the nations of the world, gathering a people for the bride, that is truth. Years ago they said there was no such a thing as speaking in tongues. It was nonsense. God promised it and he proved it to be truth. Right? Someone said this morning, I believe it was our noble sister there who deals with the children uh, so much about their baptism. She said, you can hear someone speak in tongues, but to hear someone sing in tongues That's right. see, was such a beautiful thing. I remember my first experience, I was at Rediger Tabernacle in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I was speaking, uh, having a healing service after the death of, of Brother B.E. Rediger. And Brother Bosworth had been there, Paul Rader, many of you older men, like me, you remember Paul Rader, and he was the Baptist, and we was, so we were great friends. And so while speaking there, I was going to pray for the sick. It was a strange thing to them then, but a lady brought a, a little boy down that was crippled, and he said, come across the platform. The vision of the Lord appeared and told him all about what was the matter with the little lad. And uh, I asked the girl to hand to hand me the little boy. Now, just for the sister's testimony, she might see what joy and what the real phenomena of, of grace of God, what it can do when it's worked according to the Word of God. See, God's promise for the hour. Now, God's promise to Noah won't work for us today. God's promise to, to Moses. We couldn't have Moses' message. Moses couldn't have Noah's message. We got the message of the hour. We couldn't have had Luther's message. We couldn't have had Wesley's message. This is another time. God allotted his word to each age. And as that age comes along, he sends someone there to vindicate that word, to prove that that's true. And that we see in each one then, just like what Jesus said when he's on earth, he said, you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers put them in there. Uh, uh, my people are Catholic, as you know, being an Irishman. Now, we, now they, they talk about St. Patrick, the Catholics claim him. Well, he's just about as much Catholic as I am. They talk about Joan of Arc. They burnt that girl to the stake for a witch. We all know that. Because she was spiritual and seen visions. Of course, a couple hundred years later, they dug up that priest's body and done penance and throwed him in the river. But that ain't what it takes. See, they always miss it. Man is forever praising God for what he did do, looking forward for what he will do, and ignoring what he's doing. That's just the nature of man. And he hasn't changed his nature the man of the world. So we find that our message is today, the message that we have of come out of Babylon and be free and, and be filled with the Spirit, and your lamps trimmed and clear, and look up our redemptions drawing near. We, these things are foreign to many people who breathe and call our lovely Lord's name. But yet in the midst of all that, 
We don't have nothing against those people, those denominational people. They're all right. They're fine. There are, there are uh, associates in the gospel because Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And, and all the Father hath given me, they will come. So we're only responsible for sowing seeds. Some fell by the wayside, some different kinds of ground. Some fell over and brought a hundredfold. So we're just seed sowers. God is the one who directs it when it's falling. And now we pray that maybe this morning there'd be a little seed drop along somewhere that might encourage someone. And just as a, a, a man, to finish my testimony concerning the little lady that I was going to speak of, this lady brought this little baby, a little boy, I guess about 10, 12 years old, and uh, maybe not that old. Of course, this woman was packing. And she handed him over. And just then, while I was offering prayer for the child, the little fellow jumped out of my arms and went running down the platform of about 3,500 or 4,000 people. And when they did, first thing they'd ever seen done, uh, the mother sitting on the front seat just fainted and pitched over. And a little Amish girl, are you acquainted with the Amish? I don't know where they had my hair. Long hair. They're very sweet people, very clean, nice type. You know, and all the Mennonites are Amish and so forth. We've not got one record of a juvenile delinquent. Call them funny if you want to, but we we got something like in our homes that they have. They have them one record in the courts of a, of a juvenile uh, misbehavior coming among them. They bring up their children just in one way, and that's the way they go. And this young lady was a famous pianist, a beautiful young woman, and uh, long blonde hair fixed up in the back. And when she looked across, now she was Amish. She knew nothing about Pentecost, and neither did I. But when she looked across the platform and seen that little boy going to walk across there, she threw up her hands in the air. Uh, I know there's fanaticism. I hope I'm not prone. I, I'm not a liar. And I, I'm not, if I'm wrong, I, I'm not willfully wrong. I'm ignorantly wrong. But that girl threw her hands in the air, and that hair fell down across her shoulders, and she started singing in an unknown tongue. And she was playing that hymn, The Great Physician Now is Near the Sympathizing Jesus. And when she jumped up from there, I know this sounds very strange now, but this girl had never known nothing about speaking in tongues. But she was singing in an unknown tongue. The great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. And that piano continually played. The great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. Well, they pile them alders and down through the balcony and to the floor. People screaming. That girl standing over there with her face up like that, speaking in other tongues. And that piano, the ivory key still moving. The great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping hearts to chair no other name but Jesus. Oh, it's, I has not seen, an ear has not heard what's in store for us. Yes, amen. You know what I think? Why, were, why would we ever accept the substitute or just something that's a make-belief when the heavens is full of the genuine? The real power of God that can set a soul free, that can do something for us. God bless you. Now, there's so many things. I was never told you where to get this book. <laughs> Post Office Box 325 at Jeffersonville. And if you write, well, they'd send it to you. Or either visit one of the meetings. They'll be giving them away. Now, uh, I am very grateful for this fine time of fellowship. And this morning, I was thinking about... A little story I used to tell the Christian businessman about Zacchaeus. Many of you have heard me tell him about how that this little fellow didn't believe in this discernment. And uh, of the Lord, uh, of course, I guess, as we have in every age, you see a genuine, then you see an impersonation. And we, we just have to put up with that. But good, solid thinkers and scriptural man understands. Which we, and no matter, when Mrs. Uh, Amy... Simple MacPherson, when she was uh, here on earth in her ministry, they say that pretty much every woman preacher wore those uh, wings like, you know, or gowns like that and packed the Bible. Just look at the Billy Grahams is in the land today. But, you know, 
Billy Graham could never take your place. I, I couldn't take Billy's place. He couldn't take mine. I can't take yours. You can't take mine. You're an individual in God. God made you the way you are for some purpose. Yes. If we would just find our place and then abide there, if we try to do something different, then right. see, we're, we're in somebody else's territory, which we just gone up the picture of God. Yes. We take like Billy Graham and the denominational world today as he's, as we call it, maybe to the football players. He's got the ball. Now, if you try to take the ball away from your own man, you're just messing up your team. Guard your man. See? Keep guarding him. Keep the rest of him so he can make the run. And we'll have the touchdown after a while, and Jesus will come, and then it'll all be over. The Lord bless you. Now, I'm going to the saying about this man, Zacchaeus, and I had him up this tree, you know, with the leaves all pulled around him. And then when he come down out of the tree, he went home with Jesus, and I said he became a member of the full gospel business in that chapter. So um, if there's any Zacchaeus here this morning, I hope that you take that good advice and become a member of the full gospel business. May you say, full gospel? Yes, sir. That's the only thing Jesus would have preached to you would have been the full gospel. Yes. That's right. Isn't that right? Amen. Sure. For he was the full gospel. <laughs> That's right. He couldn't deny himself. But now I have a few scriptures wrote out here of a little common little text that won't take me just a few minutes if you'll suffer with me. And um, before we do this now in our little uh, fellowship of get together and talking about the hands of the bear and the bucket and so forth. Now let's just brush aside all of this now and just think we're getting acquainted and, and we are want now to enter into the deep part of the Word. Let us bow our heads now as we approach it because we have no right to approach the Word without speaking to the author first. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, and I trust that our hearts are bowed with our heads. I wonder, while I raise my eyes to look over the audience, if there would be someone here who would say, and raise it in their hands, Brother Minister, remember me in prayer. I'm, I'm needy today. God bless you. God bless you. Now, he sees your hand. He knows what's beneath your hand in your heart. May he grant it is my prayer. Dear God, as we are grateful for this building that we, your humble children, can assemble ourselves together under here and just talk, and have fellowship, just be ourselves as we yield ourselves to Christ and desire to become more like Him. We are ministering brothers sitting near, Lord, men who are far more capable of standing here to deliver this word than I, your unworthy servant. But it has fallen my lot. Father, I pray today that if I might say something that would not be just according to the will of God, that before I say it, you'd close my mouth like... You did the lion's mouth one day uh, so they wouldn't bother Daniel. Father, we ask you now to remember each and every one, every minister, and this revival that's going on here in the city, Lord, down to the assemblies of God. I pray, dear God, that you'll send such a revival in there that this whole city will be stirred by the power of God. And all these bar rooms and wandering children around on the street will be brought to the throne of God and be filled with His goodness and with His Spirit. Grant it, Heavenly Father. And we pray that today that if there be a man or woman, boy or girl that's been brought into this meeting this morning here under the shelter from the snow, that the great Holy Spirit will visit their heart and speak to them in a mysterious way. Maybe some that's wandered away at once entertained you, Lord. But now has grown away. Bring them back, Lord, this morning. And we pray for this chapter for Brother Earl and for his wife and for the others. Grant it, Lord. Now break to us the bread of life as we open back the pages of the Word because we know... The Bible is of no private interpretation. But God does need us to interpret His Word. He's His own interpreter. He said one day, Let there be light, and there was light. 
He said, a virgin shall conceive, and she did. And in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, no matter what the world said. He did it. He needs no interpreter. He interprets his own words by making it live and vindicating it to be so. Come to our hearts, Lord Jesus, and interpret to us today the things we have need of. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the Bible, if you will turn, I believe I've never had a message that I tried to undertake to speak on that I never first read the Word because my Word will fail. I'm a man. But His Word just can't fail. He's God. So let's turn now for just a little text, and we're going to be out just in a, just about 30, 40 minutes, the Lord willing. On Revelations, now we wish to turn to the third chapter of Revelations, begin with the 14th verse. And we want to read just a, the portion. It's a message to the Laodicea Church age. And I believe... Now, I suppose most all spirit-filled people and Bible readers believe, could say amen to that, that we are in the Lady of Sea Church age, because that's the last age. Listen to the message of the condition of the church at this time. And to the angel of the church of Lady of Sea, write these things, saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee of, out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest thou not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel thee, to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, uh, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye say that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Lord bless the reading of this word. Now, I want to take for just a few moments a little text called Doors in Door. Doors in Door. Now, this is a very doors in doors, three words. Doors in door. You might say to me, uh, brother, there's probably a hundred people here. There, don't you think that's kind of a small text when you have before you a hundred souls? Well, uh, that, that may be true. The, the text is small, but uh, it isn't the size of the text that, that counts. It's what it is. Uh, it's, it's what the text says that counts. Like, I believe it was in Louisville, Kentucky, some time ago, a a little boy that was up in the attic fooling around with some old uh, trunks and up in the garret, and he run on to an old-fashioned postage stamp. Well, the first thing in his mind, he might get an ice cream cone for that. There's a collector down the street. So he tuck off down the street just as hard as he could go and said, What will you give me for this stamp? The collector looked it over and kind of faded out. He said, I'll give you a dollar. My... <laughs> That was easy sold. He would let it went for a nickel. And then been happy for it to get an ice cream. But it was sold for a dollar. The collector sold it for $500. And later, I don't know just where it did go. It went into the hundreds of dollars. You see, 
The little piece of paper wasn't very much. Just the piece that you wouldn't pick up off the floor. But it wasn't the paper that counted. It's what's on the paper that counts. And that's the way it is with reading God's Word. It isn't just the paper, the value of the paper, or the size of the paper. It's what's wrote on that paper. And one word is enough to save a world if it be received that way. Some time ago, it was uh, read a story of uh, the days of our noble, uh, one of the greatest presidents I think the nation ever had was, was Lincoln. Not because that he come from Kentucky, but because he was a great man. He was uh, deprived of an education, but yet with, with something in his heart, some purpose. I, I like a man of vision. I like people that's got something they're fighting for, just not just lay around, well, eh, well what comes along will be all right. Oh, be up and at it. And Lincoln never let his education stand in the way. He had something to do. I think every Christian ought to be that way. Find your purpose and go do it. Every member of this chapter, just thought, well, we have a breakfast once a month. That isn't it, or once every Saturday. Have a purpose in life, something you're going to do. Let's, God has placed you here. Do something about it. Every member of every church, there's a revival in town. That revival's there for a purpose. Let's get something out of it. Let's do something about it. Mr. Lincoln, there was a man that, a young fellow, he is in the war, and, and he, was, he was a coward to begin with. And in the time of duty, he, he, he withdrew from his post, and they found uh, uh, is it, something against him that he was going to have to be shot. And, oh, he, it was terrible. And one young fellow loved him so well, went to Mr. Lincoln to get a pardon, his president at the time, in the United States here. And so he went to him for a pardon. And he said to him, as he getting out of his carriage, Mr. Lincoln, a tall, bearded, a typical southern, skinny. And he said, um, Mr. Lincoln, there is a boy that's going to die in two days from now, be shot, because that he run in time of battle. And he said, Mr. Lincoln, the boy isn't a bad boy. But all those muskets of firing and, and people dying, he's nervous, and he was so upset that he, he threw up his hands and started screaming. And I said, I know the boy. I said, Mr. Lincoln, only your name on this piece of paper can spare him. Will you do it? Of course, this Christian gentleman quickly signed the paper, pardon so-and-so. Signed his name, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. Went the messenger back as hard as he could. And he ran to the cell. He said, you're free. You're free. Here's Mr. Lincoln's, Mr. Lincoln's uh, signature. You're free. He said, why would you come to mock me, knowing that I die tomorrow? He said, take that away from here. You're only mocking me. And he would not receive it. He said, no, I, I don't want it. He said, you're only making, he said if that was the, the president, said it would have the, the coat of arms. And it would have the, his right paper. He said, but it's his signature. He said, how do I know his signature? He said, you're just mocking me. You're trying to make me feel good. Uh, and he just started screaming and turned his back. The boy was shot the next morning. Then, after the boy being dead and the president's name on this piece of paper that he was pardoned, then what? And they tried it in the federal court. And here was the decision of our federal courts, which is the ultimate of all of our courts. But they say sometimes we don't like their decision, but we have to abide by it anyhow. See, because that's the tie force. That's the ultimate. Now, it said this decision, a pardon is not a pardon unless it be received as a pardon. That's the way the Word of God is. It's a pardon if it be received as a pardon. And it's a Word of God, it's a power of God to those who will believe it and accept it. No matter you're looking at it, you say, oh, that's been tangled up. There's been a million in translations and all that. It might be that to someone. But to me, it's still the Word of God, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's duty-bound to stay by that Word. Now, He's got to judge the church someday. 
And if he judges it by the Catholic Church, which they say he will, then which one of the Catholic churches will he judge it by? They're different one from the other. If he judges it by the Methodists, you Baptists are gone. If he judges it by the Pentecostals, the rest of you is gone. But he won't judge it by the church. The Bible said he'll judge the world by Jesus Christ. And Christ is the Word. So you see, we're without excuse. It's the Word of God that he judges. And no matter how small one word, uh, significance to this in Revelation 22, 18, first off again in Genesis. God gave the human race his word to fortify themselves from death, sin, and sorrow. Or any disaster. A chain of his words. Thou shalt not touch this certain tree. For the day you eat thereof, that day you die. And a chain is only its best as weak as link. And our souls are pulled over hell holding to this chain. Break one of them. That's all you have to do. Eve never broke a sentence. She broke a word by Satan. That was the first of the book. In the middle of the book come Jesus and said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Not part of them, just one here and there, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When he was dead, re resurrected, and went into heaven and returned back and gave John, which he said there after his resurrection, said, what, is, said, what it will happen to this man? Jesus said, what is it to you if he continues to I come? Knowing not exactly his life would, but his ministry would continue. And he lifted him up in the fourth chapter of Revelations and showed him all the things that was to come that we live in even to this text today. And then on the 22nd chapter, the last chapter, the 18th verse, he said, Whosoever shall take one word out of this book, or add one word to it, his part will be taken from the book of life. See? So we believe that man lives by every word of God. I believe it. And I know it's true. How little, it doesn't matter. It just takes one word to do it. Thinking about how little insignificant seeing that many of my Canadian friends sitting here, I remember I was in Canada when the King George, the one I had the privilege of going praying for him when he was healed with that multiple sclerosis. He was suffering that day from the sclerosis and also he had a stomach trouble, an ulcer, as many of you Canadians know and Americans also. But I see him pass down through there, sitting in that carriage. He, he was a king. He conducted himself as a king. His beautiful queen sitting by him in her blue dress and as he come down the streets. And a friend of mine and I were standing together. And when that carriage passed by, he just turned his head and started crying. I put my hand upon his shoulder and I said, what's the matter? He said, Brother Branham, there goes my king and his queen. Well, I, I could appreciate that. So I thought if a Canadian uh, under the government head, not government head, but still also the government head of England and passing the king by, it can make a Canadian cry and turn his head and weep. What will it be when we see our king? Yes. Amen. And to think of it, our part will be the queen. Then the children is all turned out from the schools. The little children is given a little British flag. The Canadian flag is called something else. Brother Fred, what's the Canadian flag called? Union Jack. But they give them a little a British flag to wave. And when a king passed by, all the little fellows stood out waving their, their little flag and screaming to the king. And, and um, they were bands of playing God Save the King as he marched through the street. Oh, if you could just get a, you get a view of what's going to be at that resurrection there. And when they were instructed, the little fellows, to return back to school as soon as the, the parade was over. And the little fellows going back, one school missed a little girl. And they went everywhere to find the little fellow, up and down the streets, and finally, behind a telegraph pole, stood the little bitty tiny dwarf girl, just to crying her little heart out. Well, that teacher picked her up and put What's the matter? Did you not see the king? She said, Yes, I saw the king. Said, Did did you not wave your flag? She said, Yes, I, I waved my flag. She said, well, then, why are you crying? She said, you see, teacher, I am so little 
The others are standing in front of me. They were bigger. And I waved my flag, but he didn't see it. And she was disturbed about it. Well, that might be that King George did not see that little fellow in statue. He might not have seen her patriotic heart and how she felt towards him. She was too short. But it isn't so with our king. Oh, the least little thing we do, he sees it and he knows the very things and thoughts that's in our hearts. Whatever we do, what little it is, and how do we serve him? As we serve each other. If I don't love you, how can I love him? See? In so much as you've done unto these, my little ones, you've done it unto me. See, it's the it's little things that we leave undone sometimes that breaks the whole chain, you see, and lets us go free, just denominational-minded, and forget about these little things that really are the, the essential things. Everything, every word of God is essential. None of it can be left out. We've got to take every word of it just the way it was wrote. I stand at the door, said Jesus, in this lady of sea age, and knock. Did you notice the only church age that he has put out of his church? All the other church ages, he was inside the church. Through the Methodists and Lutherans and so forth, he was on the inside church. But here he's outside. Our creeds and, and things have run him out of the church. But he's standing out there still knocking. He that will hear and open the door, I'll come in with him sup with him and give him healing for his eyes and, and clothes and give him the riches of heaven. He that will hear me not. I thought I could think of the name of that artist that drew that picture, painted the picture rather, of uh, at the door. When he, you know, all great pictures first must go through the line or the hall of critics before it can be hung in the hall of fame. That original painting now will run millions of dollars. But see, it like the church has to pass through the hall of critics. We go through. You're going to be called holy roller. You're going to be called everything. But if you can only hold your position in Christ, then someday you'll take us to the hall Amen. of fame. But first, we've got to stand criticism. That's where the littleness of us stands. Then that's where it shows. He that cannot stand chastisement is an illegitimate child and not a child of God. No matter how much he's joined church and whatever he's done, he still, if he cannot stand chastisement, he's an illegitimate and he's not a real child of God. But a real genuine child of God don't care what the world says. Everything else is secondarily. He's got his mind on Christ and that settles it. Whatever Christ says, do, he'll do it. Wherever the Lamb goes, they're with him. Wherever. And then you see his appearing, his presence and what he does, he's always with his people, his bride, his courtner. Someday there's going to be a wedding supper. And this artist, however, when it went through the critics, a bunch of critics gathered around this artist. I can't think of his name. I'm trying to think of Michelangelo, but he was a sculpture of Moses' uh, monument. But I can't think of his name. But however, he said, your picture is outstanding. Said, I have nothing that I could say against the picture. He said, because he's holding a lantern in his hand, it shows that he comes to the, in the darkest of night. He said, and then he's at the door with his head, his ear, so he won't be, be sure not to miss the faintest call. He has his ear turned to the door, and he's rapping at the door. He said, but you know, sir, there's one thing that you forgot in your picture. And the artist taking him a lifetime to paint it. He said, what is that that I have forgotten, sir? He said, no matter how much that he knocked. See, you forgot to put a latch on it. There's no latch on the door. If you'll notice the door, there's no latch on it. Oh, said the artist, I painted it thus. You see, sir, he said, the latch is on the inside. You're the one that opens the door. You open the door. Oh, what does a man knock on a man's door for? He's trying to gain entrance. He's trying to get in. He's perhaps got something uh, 
he wants to tell you, talk over you. He's got a message for you. And that's the reason people knock at one another's door. They've got some reason to do it. There cannot be that happen without some reason. You would not go to a man's house unless there's some reason to go. There's nothing else to visit, take him a message, or some thing. There's some reason for a man to go knock on another man's door. Wherever there's a question, there's got to be an answer. There could not be a question without an answer. So that's what we look for in the Bible. These questions of the day, the Bible has the answer. And Christ is that answer. Now, many important people have knocked the doors down through the time of life, and many knocked in times past, and they probably times keep on to be many more important people. Now, the first thing, perhaps if somebody knocked at your door, if you could, you'd slip around and pull back the curtain, see who's there. If you're busy, as we claim we are today, too busy to go to church, too busy to do this, and, you know, my church don't believe in that kind of stuff. And I, See, we're just a little out of cater sometimes from the Word. But you pull back the curtain, then you want to see who's standing there. And if it's a man of importance, quickly you run to the door. Now let's go back just a little bit and take a few people that's not. Let's go back and think of Pharaoh in Egypt many hundreds of years ago. What if, if Pharaoh, king of Egypt, came down to a peasant's house, and uh, this peasant had been kind of uh, uh, oh, uh, disagreeable with Pharaoh and he didn't believe his policies, and he's different with him. And, and, but here stands Pharaoh standing at the door of a, a brick mason or a mud dauber, as we call him, uh, down in Egypt. And he pulls his curtain back, and there stands a mighty Pharaoh at the door. He's knocking, a smile on his face. Why, wow, that peasant would open the door and say, Enter, great Pharaoh. May your humble servant find grace in your sight. If there's anything within my walls, I am as much as a slave to you, Pharaoh. You've honored me above my brethren. You've come to my house when I'm a poor man. You only visit kings and, and nobles and important people, and I'm of unimportance. But you, you, you visit me. You've honored me, Pharaoh. What is it thy humble servant could do? No matter what Pharaoh would ask, even to his life, he'd give it. Sure, it's an honor. Or say, for instance, the late Adolf Hitler, when he was fear of Germany. What if he had went down to a soldier's house? And that bunch of little Nazi soldiers all camped around, and the first thing you know, uh, uh, somebody knocked at the door, and... The little soldier said, ah, I feel bad this morning. Why? Tell him to go away. And she slipped over to the door and pulled the curtain back. She said, husband, husband, jump up quick. What's the matter? Who's standing there? Hitler. The fear of Germany. Oh, my. That little soldier jumped out, got his clothes on quick, stood at the kitchen, walked up past the door, knocked the door, and opened up the door and said, hail Hitler. See, he was a great man in his days in Germany. What is it could I do? If he'd have said, go jump off the cliff out there, he'd have done it. Why? There's no more, there's not a greater important man in Germany in the days of the Nazis than Adolf Hitler was. He was a great man. And he, uh, and what honor when he only visits generals and great men. But here he's at a little footman's door. Oh, it would certainly been a great honor to him. Well, now, what a flagstaff. We're bringing it closer to home. What if this afternoon that, uh, that our president, uh, Mr. Johnson, L.B. be Johnson, what if he would uh, get off of a plane out here somewhere, and now we're all just in one class of people. We're all poor. Maybe one has a little better job, maybe a little better house, but after all, we're just human. But... What if he come down to your house down here, maybe the humblest of us, and he knocked at the door, and you went to the door, and there stood President L.B. Johnson? Why, it would be a great honor. You might differ with him in politics, but you'd be an honored man to have the President of the United States stand at your door? Who are you? 
Well, who am I? And there stands Lyndon Johnson at your door. Though you might be a socialist or Republican or different with him a million miles, but yet it would be an honor. You know what? Because that you were granted this honor. Why the television with Dodo on the screen tonight? Sure. The newspapers morning will have headlines in it. And here in the Flagstaff paper, the John Doe, the President of the United States, flew into Flagstaff yesterday, uncalled for, and just went down without even invitation and knocked at your door. Humble, that President would have a name of being a humble man, as great as he is to come to mine or your door. We're nobody. Then come down and talk to us while you walk down the street and say, yes, <laughs> I'm the fellow. The president visit me. Mm -hmm. Stand still. Let me get your get your profile. Look straight at me. Now, how do you look when you walk away? You would be an important person. Sure. Well, if the Queen of England would come, though she, you're not under her dominion, but it'd be an honor for some of you women to entertain the Queen of England, though you're not under her domain. But yet, she's a great person. She's the great, greatest queen in the world at this time. Certainly, she is. That's political speaking. But if she asked you for some little trinket on your wall that you valued ever so high, you'd give it to her. It would be an honor for you to do it. Sure, she's the Queen of England. And you'd be honored by the President. And everybody would talk about the humility of the Queen of England flying over to see a certain woman in Flagstaff, a little nobody. And the papers would pack it and the news would flash it. But you know, the most important person of all times, Jesus Christ, Amen. knocks at our door, and he's turned away more than all the kings and potentates there ever was. That's right. And you might accept him and go out and say something about the outside world would laugh in your face. No news is going. Who could come to your house any greater than Jesus Christ? Who could knock at your door greater than Jesus Christ? Who could do that? The Son of God. Who could knock at your house? Who would be more important? And yet he knocks day after day. And if you even accept him, you're called a fanatic. So see how the world knows its own? That's right. But now he wouldn't come unless he had a reason to come. And you think the humility of President Johnson, or the Queen of England, or any great person, how it would be displayed of the humility of that great important person to knock at your door. How about the humility of the Son of God? Who are we but sinners? Filthy, born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. Then the Son of God will come and knock at our door. Now, the Queen of England might ask you a favor. She might take something from you. So might the President. He might ask you to do things that you didn't want to do. He might ask you for treasures that you didn't want to give up. And which would mean nothing just to him. But Jesus is bringing something to you when he knocks. Amen. He's bringing a pardon. Don't turn it down. Or as is tried in our courts here, so will it be in the kingdom of heaven. If he knocked and brought the pardon and you turned it down and die in your sins, you'll perish. Though you had the honor of sitting in a meeting like this. Though you had the honor of attending the revival. Or your church and heard your pastor preach a gospel message. And you had the honor. You say, yes, I was there. Baby, you hard to tell what all you could say. I heard the singing. I enjoyed it. I heard the testimonies. It was real. But you turned it down. What if I was a young man and found a young lady? She was beautiful. She's a Christian. She, may, she is ever qualified. You can't find no fault with it, but you've got to lay aside traditions of man. That's right. You say, well, I believe that's right. I see God. But you've got to accept it. Amen. You, then that woman becomes part of me. Then you become part of the Word, which is the bride. If he is the Word, the bride will be a bride word. See? Certainly will. See, you've got to accept it. You would, uh, you could say what you want. You could brag about the president, but.
But usually when Jesus turn, comes to our door, we just turn him aside. He just, we don't want nothing to do with him. Now we say, well, some other day. What if you knocked at somebody's door? Now let's just turn the picture right around for a minute. What if you went and knocked on somebody's door and you had something for them? And after all, they were to you about like you'd be to God. Well, if you do, why, well, all right, but you got no strange time. So when you knocked on somebody's door and they peeped out the window and shut the door. Or either come to the door and say, some other time. Well, I'd like, I ain't got time this morning. You know what you do? Probably the same thing I do and the rest of them. You wouldn't go back anymore. But not Jesus. I stand and knock. Continually knock. He that seeketh, not seek, seeketh. He that knocketh, not knock is a continuation, knocketh. See? He that seeketh, he that knocketh, it shall. Not just like the parable of the unjust judge. The woman went and wanted revenge, but she couldn't get it. He continually, she knocked and pleaded and she said, just to get rid of her, I'll avenge her enemy. How much more will the heavenly father? There ought to be us knocking at his door. It all been Adam running up and down the garden, hollering, Father, Father, where are you? But instead, instead of that, it was God running up and down the garden. Son, son, where are you? See, that's just this place what we are. We're always hiding. Instead of coming right out and confessing it, we try to run hide behind something. That's just the nature of man. We have it that way. Yes, sir, you would give these people the best you had, everything. But you wouldn't... Uh, you, 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 you wouldn't accept Jesus. I ain't meaning you, but I mean the people here. Or maybe you might say this. You may say, preacher, I just did that. I, I, I just opened my heart and let Jesus come in. I did that 10 years ago. I did that 20 years ago. Well, that may be just exactly right. But is that all you've done? See? I want to ask you now. If you would invite anybody in your house... And then when you got inside the door, somebody invited you in, rather. Say, come in, yes. I have a purpose. I'll go out of town and be honored, you see. That's the way a lot of people accept Christ. Uh, I'll, uh, I, I belong to the church. I belong to the big so-and-so place down here, Dr. P-H-L-L. Uh, it's the biggest church. The mayor goes there and everything, you know. I, I belong to that church. They let him in just that much. Yeah, I'll accept him, see, for a personal gain. But what then, when Jesus comes into the heart... Many people accept him because they don't want to go to hell. But when Jesus comes into your heart, he wants to be Lord. Yes. Yes. Not just the Savior, but Lord also. Lord is rulership. That's right. He comes in to, to take over. Now, you say, is that right, Brother Bram? Sure. What if, if I invited you at my house and you come in the door and I, you knock at the door and I looked outside, I said, yes, come on in. If you can help me, well, you do so. But now, when you come in, now, I don't want you meddling around in my house. You stand right there at the door. You remember, our text is doors inside the door. Now, inside the human heart, there's many little doors. <laughs> and that little doors covers up a lot of things. Just to let him in, that isn't all of it. When he comes in, when I come in your house, if you welcome me in the door... Well, if you'd say, come in, Brother Branham. I'm so glad to see you. I'd say, well, it's a privilege for me to come into your house. Oh, won't you come over and sit down? Brother Branham, go through our house. Make yourself at home. Oh, my. I go over to the refrigerator. Get me one of those great big sandwiches about like that. Take off my shoes and go in the bedroom. Lay down. And I just have a, a real gastronomical jubilee. See? Why? Because I felt welcome. You made me welcome. Therefore, I'd appreciate it if you made me welcome. But if I went in your house and you told me, you stand at the door now, don't you go to meddling around, I wouldn't feel too welcome. Would you? You wouldn't feel welcome. Somebody invited you and said, now wait. Yeah, come in, but stand right there. Now, there is a little door when you come into the human heart we we'll just speak of a couple of them. See? We don't have time to go through all these doors because there's lots of them. See? But say the next ten minutes. Let's speak of 
couple, three doors. Now, on the right-hand side of the human heart, when you walk into the door, there's a little door on the right side, and that's called in there the door of pride. Oh, my. Don't you go to enter in that door. They don't want the Lord in there. On that door, that's pride. I'm a blue blood. I take care. Of, oh, yes, I look. I tell you, I, I see, it's pride. Don't you meddle in there. Now, he can't feel welcome as long as you keep that pride door shut. He's got to humiliate you. See? That's what he comes in for. You mean to tell me I have to go down there and act like the rest? Of, well, you don't have to. <laughs> that's one thing, sure. Well, I'll tell you, what do you think I'd do when I went to the business council the next time? What would I do if I met with my, my, my employer tomorrow? And that I'd have to get that spirit on me, and I'd jump out right there in the middle of my work and go to speaking in tongues. Oh, that would humiliate me. No, stay out of there. Oh, there you are, see. Yeah, you let Jesus come in. You'll join church and put your name on it. Accept Jesus as your Savior. But what about being your Lord? When he's got full sway. When he's Lord, he's got it all belongs to him. You, you're completely surrendered to him. Now, but that little pride. Oh, you mean for us women, we're going to have to let our hair grow? Well, that's what he said. We're going to have to quit wearing manicure, makeup stuff. That's what he said. Well, what do you think my sewing circle is? They call me old-fashioned. Well, just keep your pride. Go ahead. You'll stand at the door. That's all farther he can get. But when you're ready to open that door, let him come in. He'll clean it out for you. Shorts will go out here in the garbage can and makeup will go back to the garbage can and the barber will starve to death. He's just cut women's hair. You're a real believer. And I say that to, oh, yes, it does. That's what the Bible says. Right. See, there's a little word there that you don't want him meddling. Well, my pa- I don't care what pastor said. That's what the Bible says. It's a shame for a woman to do so. Well, you say we ought to teach us things, Brother Branham, is how to get the Holy Ghost and how to be this, that. How are you going to learn algebra if you don't know your ABC? Don't know even how to, to act like, look like one, dress like one. It's a shame to see these women on the street today. I went into a place yesterday when oh, some of the perverted gang come in. They, the man had hair in their eyes, come down and hung down on their back and like legatarts, like little kids wear to school with great big old shoes on, mouth half open. You can tell they were delinquents. And walk in there like I said, we're French. Who in the world would hire a man like that in his business? Amen. How do they make a living? I've seen a couple of real boys studying over there. They come from that university down there. Uh, these beatniks did, or I believe they call themselves bugs or beetles or something <laughs> like that. Some of that stuff coming from England. And then in there like that, who would hire a man like that to work for him? Would you put a man like that in your business, you businessman? If you would, you're... There's something you ain't got close enough to the cross yet. <laughs> Look at these women out on the street. And it's a disgrace. Maybe innocent little women with these little bitty clothes on. What's a disgrace? The way they look. Well, you say, well, woman, you're committing adultery. They say, wait a minute here, young man. I'm just as virtuous as I. That might be so. In your own thoughts, it might be so proven even by a medical examination that you might be. But remember, at the day of the judgment, you're going to answer for committing adultery. Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And you presented yourself to him. See how the devil's got him blinded? It's a disgrace. It's a shame, you see. They, they got a spirit. It's a spirit that does that. It's an unholy spirit. Amen. But a genuine holy spirit will make a woman dress decently and look holy. Amen. My wife said to me one time, we was going down the street and we found a woman with a dress on back in our country. It's a very strange thing. See? Not too many Pentecostals back there. So we find out she had a dress on. And she said, Billy, said, I know some of them women. They sing in choirs down here at these churches. I said, sure. I said, well... And them claim to be Christians. I said, honey, look, see, we're not. So why do our people, I said, look, honey, we're not of their, their, their race at all. She said, what? I said, they're Americans. I said, yeah, but we're not. She said, we're not. I said, no. I said, when I go in Germany, I find a spirit of Germany. When I went to Finland, 
uh, the Sandra up there, and then he finished, you know, the women kill the man the baths. So that's just a Finnish spirit. Not fine people, but you find wherever you go, you find a national spirit. You go into a church and watch the pastor, if he's real wild and cares on, the congregation be the same. Right. See, they take the spirit of one another instead of the Holy Spirit. That's where you got so much perverted teaching of the Bible. Amen. Instead of coming back to the blueprint, Amen. they take the spirit of some denomination. The, the word just as foreign to him as it was in the days when Jesus come forth introducing the real true gospel. He said, he's a devil, he's Beelzebub. But there you get it. And she said, well, then we're not Americans, what are we? I said, our kingdom is up above. We are reborn again. The kingdom of God is within you. See, act like up there. Your delegates from there. I said, we're citizens here, living here in the flesh. But our spirits, we are pilgrims and strangers. We're foreign to the world, even our own nation, for we have accepted the invitation when it knocked at our heart to become part of Him, His Word. And the Word fixes us, makes us live, and makes us act like Christians. Some time ago in the South, a little story. There was a king uh, uh, or buyer. He sold slaves. That was the time of, of uh, segregation, and they had slaves in the South. There was a they go by and buy them. It's like you would have used car off of a lot. Now, I am an integrationist, absolutely. I mean, a segregationist. I am a segregationist because I don't care how much they argue, you cannot be a Christian to be an integrationist. That's exactly right. God even separates his nations. He separates his people. Come out from among them. He's a, he is a segregationist. Don't even touch not through unclean things. He pulled Israel, uh, the Jewish race, out of ever all the races of the world. He is a segregationist. But I don't believe that any man is to be a slave. God made man, man made slaves. I don't believe one should rule over other in any race, color, or anything. But there is a segregation. The bride of Christ is segregated from the rest of the churches. That's exactly right. Church national, the church spiritual. Church carnal, the church the word. It always has been. Jesus came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him. So this used to be buyers, brokers, go by and buy these slaves. One time this one come to a great plantation and he watched them and the slaves are hard beaten and everything. You know, there's a way from home they never go back again. The Boers, uh, Hollanders that went over and got them, brought them here and sold them. And they never see Papa again, Mama again, never see their babies again. They bred them with one another, take the big man, breed him to a big woman, away from his own wife to make bigger slaves. Oh, God will make them answer for that someday. That's right. That isn't right. Like Abraham Lincoln said one time when he got off a boat there in New Orleans, picked off his stovepipe hat. You seen three or four little Negroes coming down, standing there with no shoes on, where the uh, cow had laid and got... Uh, Got the frost off the ground. They stand there for running the cows in their little feet, bursting, bleeding. This thing, and you got shoes, I got shoes. No, oh, God's children's got shoes. When he got off the boat down there and walked up to the bullpen, there was a great big Negro standing up there, whipping him around, testing his heart, and running him up down the street with a whip behind him and check his heart, see if he's all right. His poor little wife standing there, two or three kids under her arms like that, to sell him to breed him to a bigger woman. Old Abraham Lincoln stuck that under his hat, his hat under his arm like that, and hit his fist. He said, That's wrong! Someday I'll get that if it costs my life. Yonder in a museum in Chicago lays a dress with the blood on it that freed that Negro from that. And I say that sin and things is wrong. God help me to hit it. And all other ministers of the gospel. We are born free children of God. We have no business for any creed or cult to run us into a world council of churches. We are free born men in the Holy Ghost. We have a right. We come out of such stuff as that to be Pentecostal. Right. Now, we are free. We don't have to be bound down to those things again. So this buyer said, looking across his slaves, a hundred or something on a big plantation, he said, say, one little fellow there, they didn't have to whip him. His chest out, his chin up, right on the job. He said, say, I want to buy him. He said, oh, no. The owner said, he's not for sale. Mm -mm. He said, well, is he a slave? He said, yep. He said, well, what makes him so different? I said, do you feed him different? He said, no, they all eat out there in the galley together. I said, is he the boss over him? He said, no, he's just a slave. I said, what makes him different? I said, you know, I wondered that myself. But I said, you know, over in the homeland where they come from in Africa, that boy's father is a king of the tribe. Though he's an alien, he conducts himself like a king's son. 
Oh, I thought, what a thing for Christians. Women, stop that wearing them clothes like that. Man, stop that telling them smutty jokes and all that stuff. We're sons and daughters of the king. Dress like a queen. Dress like a, a lady. Act like a gentleman. Don't let your hair grow down like this. The Bible said it's wrong. Nature teaches you for a man to have long hair. And it's a disgrace and a common thing for even a woman to pray with her hair cut. And how about these? Uh, it's, a, it's an abomination for a woman to put on a garment that pertains to a man. The great unchanging God doesn't change. But yet today, it's just as loose as the rest of our nation is. Shame. Let's act like sons and daughters of God. Let's live like it. We are, we are sons of a king. We are, we are right now this bunch of mess and dirt and filth around here. People call themselves Christians and still acting like that. But remember, we got to knock one day and open him in. Pride and all left. Amen. I don't care what they call me. Oh, I guess I'm just a little old-fashioned. But my Savior was old-fashioned too. Is that right? You've heard the song. Be old-fashioned. Don't try to pattern after somebody else. He's your example. Try to be like him and the Spirit in you. I'll help you to do that. Make your life like his. Yeah? There's a door there. I want to call it another door. I get too wound up. There's another door there, just next to that door, going around the right-hand side. And that door is a door to your private life. Ooh. Oh, you don't want him messing with that. Now, if I want to go out to a little cocktail party, what is it to you? What church is going to tell me what I'm going to do? Mm-hmm. There you are. A tenth of my wages? Who's going to tell me what to do? That's my own private life. I make this money. I have my own life. I wear shorts if I want to. That's my own American privilege. That is true. Sure. Right. But if you're a lamb and not a goat, see, lambs is what he's after. They'll be separated someday. A sheep has wool. That's the only thing it has. And it can't manufacture that wool. We're not asked to manufacture the fruit of the Spirit, but to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And as long as it's a, a sheep, it'll bear. It don't have to manufacture. The glands and everything in it is sheep. It'll make wool because the inside of him has the glands and the adrenaline and stuff that takes to make wool. And when you're a Christian, you cope with the Word. I don't care what anybody else says. You don't have to work up nothing, bring down nothing, pull up, pop up. You're a Christian. You just automatically bear the fruit of the Spirit. And that's the way it is. See? But people today, they don't want you fooling with their private life. The only thing you do is open up every door around there and say, Come on in, Jesus. Watch what happens. When you see in the book you're supposed to do this, you'll do it. Amen. Why, you're a sheep to begin with, then. But if you just want to stick a kick at the door, just say, I join church. I'm as good as you. <laughs> see? I accept the Christ. Maybe that's just what you've done. But did you make him Lord? See, now the Lord cannot set down a book of rules and say a word and then come around tonight. And if you say you got the Holy Ghost and the Bible says a certain thing, do you say, oh, I don't believe that. You just remember, that spirit in you is not the Holy Spirit because he can't deny himself. <laughs> right, he can't deny himself. He wrote the Word and he watches over to perform it. See? So it's not the Holy, it's a spirit, all right. It might be a, a spirit of the church. It might be the spirit of the pastor. It might be the spirit of the world. It might be, I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, it might be a denominational spirit. I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Pentecostal, I'm this... Pentecost, now remember, let me straighten it. Pentecost is not an organization. Pentecost is an experience that you receive. You Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, and all can experience Pentecost. You can't join Pentecost because there's no way to join it. I've been in the Branham family for 55 years. You know what everybody asked me to become a Branham? (laughs) I was born a Branham. That's how you're a Christian. You're born a Christian. That's right. Now, all that private life. I tell you, my pastor goes to these dances. We do the twist to have it. All right. See. Don't you come telling me what I can't do and what I can't do. All right. See, you won't let him in. Just let him in one time. Then go back to the twist or the rock and roll or whatever you're going to do. See what you can do. You can't do it. Let him in one time and then start put on a pair of shorts, some of you women. I know I'm taking you a long time, but I want to say one more thing if it's all right in this regard. 
I suppose the greatest meeting the Lord ever let me hold for him was in Bombay, where he had around 500,000, but and 200 and something thousand in, in Africa, Durban, at the racetrack. That afternoon, I said, after it seemed such a great, marvelous thing, and our gracious Lord come down and done, I said, the missionaries taught you the Word, but the Word is quickened and made alive. What he says has to come to life. And, I said, and then when there was 25,000 healings taking place at one time, and load after load of old charity, it's one simple little prayer that seen the Holy Spirit, just those people that didn't even know who they were and where they come from, that's all they wanted to see. And I asked, how many wants to receive Christ? There was 30,000 stood to their feet. Blanket natives, packing idols. Dr. Bosworth, Dr. Baxter, and I began weeping. And Brother Bosworth rumped through and said, Brother Bram, this is your carnation day. Brother Baxter said, Brother Bram, I wonder, I think they meant physical healing. That boy is on his hands and knees, and the Holy Spirit told him where he come from, what had happened. He said, you're talking, think about your brother. He's about a half a mile back there. He's riding on a yellow goat, and he hurt his leg. I said, but thus saith the Lord, he's healed. Here come the boy with the crutches over his hands like that, and it taking about 20 minutes for militia to quieten him down. Then this boy on his hands and feet like that, down, couldn't even raise up naked. Oh, my, such a horrible thing. He thought he's coming up there to tour us in order to kind of do the, the jungle dance. Which I took the chain and shook him. I said, if I could help that poor creature and wouldn't do it, I'd be a, I wouldn't be fit to stand back here. But I said, I can't help him. But now I have a little gift. I can just pull it in gear, whatever the Lord says. And when the Lord showed, called him who he was, that his mother and father sitting out in there, they're Zulas, and said they're thin, unusual. A Zula averaged 300 pounds per man. So then said they're unusual. But this boy was born in a Christian home because on, his, on the right-hand side, as you go in the door, there's a picture of Christ in the little thatch hut. That was exactly right. His mother and father raised up. That's his name. That's who he was and everything. They couldn't understand. I look back. I see him standing in the vision there, just as straight as he could be. Never raised up in his life. He's born like that. I said, the Lord Jesus makes him whole. He wasn't even in his right mind. Trying to go, blah, 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 like that. And I got a hold of the chain and shuck it like that. I said, Jesus Christ, son, makes you whole. Stand up on your feet. There he raised up. The tears running down and off his black belly as he went out like that. I seen 30,000 Blanket natives give their hearts to Jesus Christ. When I had a Qantas club, I said, now, and tell me I was going to become a holy roller when I left the Baptist church so I could fellowship with all people. They said, well, you have become a holy roller. I said, a bunch of my Baptist friends said, I said, you've sent missionaries in there for the last 150 years. What did I find them still packing idols? I said, but the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 30,000 received Christ at one time. Now I want to say to you women, you know what happened to them women? I said, right on the grounds where you're standing, the Holy Spirit will fill you. And when they raised their hands to accept Christ as their Savior, and when they walked away from there naked now, nothing but just a little patch clout in front, and when they walked away from there, they folded their arms like this because it's the presence of man after they'd accepted Christ. Now, how can we, sisters, how can we in this nation where we claim to believe and be Christians, and every year they take more off? When that person never even heard the name of Christ, but just accept him in their heart. No, you couldn't tell them they were naked. They didn't know it. But they covered themselves up like this to walk away. And the next day or two, you find them with clothes on of some kind. Amen. Oh, my, there's something wrong. Summer, it's a twisting up of theology. The power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like he did to the man who called Legion. We found him clothed and in his right mind. And I begin to believe that it's a spirit upon the people that drives them into that Americanism and Frenchism and all kinds of worldism and churchism. But let them once come to that master and they feel that knock at the door. They'll put clothes on and act like women and men and they'll be born again Christians. Amen. Yes. Ah, I'm done. 20 minutes until 12. Just a, just a few minutes. Let me bypass some. Just a moment, some scriptures. I'd like to open one more door. It would be all right. Amen. The next door to there is faith. See? Your private life, your pride, your private life. Now, let's open faith. This whole ring of them. But let's go into faith. You know, some time ago I was in the hospital, and a woman going on her operation, she called me. She said, Brother Bram, I'm a backslider. Would you pray for me? I said, yes, ma'am. I'll be glad to. I said, you're a backslider. Yeah. I said, now let's just wait just a minute. Let me read the scriptures to you. There's a lady laying there in bed looking at me real funny, her and her son, about 20 years old, a regular Ricky. And then they're looking at me like that. I said, uh, yes, ma'am. I said, uh, 
I've read the scriptures to her. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, be white like wool. And when I read that to her, I said, if you strayed away, see, you got away from God, but God never got away from you, or you wouldn't be calling for me. She started crying. I said, we'll pray. That lady over the next bed, she said, wait a minute, wait a minute there. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, pull that curtain. And I said, aren't you a Christian? She said, we're a Methodist. I said, well, what's that got to do with it? Huh? That's the more than saying you was a, you was a cold if you was in a pig pen. See, I said, that don't mean a thing. Amen. But you see, that's where it's coming, self-righteous. That's against our faith. I said, we don't divine healing in our church of that kind of stuff. See? See what I mean? See? They won't let in that door. That's against our faith. There's only one faith. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. Amen. That faith. My faith looks up to thee. Thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray. Take all my unbelief away. Sin. Sin. There's only one sin. That's unbelief. A man that drinks isn't a sinner. See, that, that, that is, see, isn't sin. It isn't, a, it isn't a sin to drink. It isn't a sin to commit adultery, to lie, to steal. That isn't sin. That's the attributes of unbelief. If you was a believer, you wouldn't do that. See, it's only two. You're unbeliever or believer. See, one or the other. You don't do all these things in religious orders like that just because you're an unbeliever. If you're a believer, it's the Word you believe in because Christ is the Word. See? And so you're just an unbeliever because that you believe some tradition or some dogmas has been added to the Bible or something, and denominations do. But a real believer stays right with that word, and God works right through that word right through to make it come to pass in this generation that we live in. And now notice, you say, oh, I, uh, Brother Bram, the Lord, well, that's all right. There's many uncircumcised uh, Philistine went one time, too, and a bunch of Egyptians tried to follow Moses across the, the Red Sea, but it, it finally, as Jambres and Jambres withstood Moses, well, we find the same thing in the last day, the Bible says. Now, just a little further. Jesus said here, in this, this age, Because thou sayest that I am rich and increased in goods. Let's look how we are today. Rich as the church ever was. And, well, you know, you Pentecostal would be a lot better off if you was out there with a tambourine on the corner, like your fathers and mothers was. But you got better churches than the rest of them now. Fastest growing in the world. But where's that spirit of God that used to be among us? You left out the real thing. Because you say, I am rich. Remember, this is Pentecostal it's speaking to. Because the Pentecostal age is the last age. See, all this revival we've had, no other organization starting up, they won't be. This is the end. The wheat's mature now. It's come up through the leaves and stalk and husk, and it's out to the wheat now. Won't be no more. They start a little ladder rain, but it just fell right in. Anything else? Well, this is the wheat's coming for. Notice. See, because you say, I am rich and increased in goods, have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art miserable, wretched, blind, naked, and don't know it. I counsel of thee, oh my, I knock at your door, Lady Asita. I knock at your door, counsel, to come to me and, and buy gold, try in the fire, white raiment that your nakedness not be shown. Take off these things and put on like you should, see, the righteousness of Christ, yes. the Word. See. Not my righteousness, His righteousness. And I also counsel you to, to come get some eye salve that you might anoint your eyes, that you might see. I say, uh, I'm a Kentucky, and I was born down the mountains, and we used to have a little old place up in the attic, and, and uh, thus kids had boosted up a, a little old a pole ladder that we went up there every night, and we laid down the head of put a piece of canvas over the top of us when it snowed. Well, these stars, old clapboard shingles. How many knows what a clapboard shingle is? Well, brother, why didn't I wear my overhauls up here? I'm right at home, see? Well, the yeah, old clapboard shingle. How many know what a straw mattress is? Now, what do you know? I thought I felt awful religious about something. But I guess I am right at home now. That's good. I never know nothing else just a few years ago. How many knows what an old lamp is? Old chimney. Old... That with the big old moon and owl on the side. I used to have the littlest hand in the house, have clean that old churn. You know, I used to have to take an old splasher and I'd all splash over me, so I tuck that lamp chimney and turn it over there and keep it from splashing. Yes, indeed. Now, 
My grandpa was a trapper. My mother, mother, comes from the reservations. He married an Indian girl from the Cherokee reservations there, Kentucky and Tennessee, you know, where the Cherokee Valley. And uh, they, he, he hunted and trapped all the time. That was, his, that was the way he made his living. And us kids laying up there, well, uh, sometimes it get real cold, that uh, breeze coming through there. We get cold in our eyes, and, and our eyes are thick shut at night. You know, my mama called it matter. I don't know, I don't know what that is. But uh, cold, get in your eyes, you get cold. And she said, you got matter in your eyes because of the, of the oh, you know, the breeze circling through there, the draft. They come across, and I, our eyes are swell shut. And mama would get there at the latter morning when she got the biscuits made. She'd uh, have the sorghum of molasses sitting on the table, and she'd say, Billy! I'd say, yes, Mama. You and Edward, come on down. Mama, I can't see. I call my brother. We call him Humpy. I say, he can't see either. See, our eyes got matter in them. She'd say, all right, just a minute. And Grandpa, when he catch a coon, how many knows what a raccoon is? That's what, and she ca- he'd catch a coon. He'd get the fat off of it and put it in a can. And that coon grease was a cure-all in our country. <laughs> We'd give it to us for a bad cold with turpentine on it and coal oil. We swallow for a sore throat, and then you get that coon grease hot, and she come and massage her eyes, and our eyes would come open. See, it's coon grease that did it. See, my brother, sister, we went through a cold spell <laughs> in the church. And that's right. A lot of religious draft has come to you. <laughs> Everybody's called cold. <laughs> a lot of people's got their eyes all closed up, and there's a big world council of churches coming up up here. It's going to force every one of you into it. They're getting away from that word. Our own groups are. I am duty bound to a message. Not to be different, but because of love. Love is corrective. Come back. Stay away from that thing. You ministering brothers, I don't care what your groups do. Stay away from it. Stay out of it. The mark of the beast. Stay away from it. See? Jesus is knocking this lady at CAA. See where they put him out? He's trying to get to individuals, not, not organizations or groups of people. He's trying to get one here and one there and one there. Trying All that I love, I chasten. As the little brother had the vision here, he said he had the vision. He said, this same light that you receive could cause your death too. See? As many as I love, I chasten. Be zealous. In return, I'm standing at the door and knocking. Now look, coon grease won't do this any good. But there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I, though vile as he, he opened my eyes with his eye salve. His spirit came down and warmed the Bible, his eye salve. I couldn't see it. I was a, just a local Baptist pastor. But one day he sent his spirit down not the coon grease did he get hot, but he sent the Holy Spirit in fire. Amen. A little eye salve raked across my Bible, my Bibles, and I could see with my eye, me raked across my eyes so I could see my Bible, and I seen that he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Let every man be a lie and mine be true. I stand at the door and knock. One more little story. Can't we got time? Then that, that, I'll go. Sir. There was a an old darky down there in the south. And this pastor, I knew him, and nice old fella. We called him Gabe. His name was Gabriel, and we just called him Gabe. He always, Pastor and I, we, we went hunting a whole lot. His old colored brother, and we went out hunting. And so old Gabe liked to hunt better than anybody I ever know, but he was a poor shot. So one day his pastor and him went hunting. And we could never get old Gabe to line up to church. He just wouldn't do it. He wouldn't come to church. He said, ah, I I said, don't go down there where the hypocrites is. I said, but Gabe, as long as you stay out, they're bigger than you. You're hiding behind them, see? I said, you're hiding behind them. You're smaller than they are. They do go down to make an effort. Yeah. And so he said, I, I just, I, I say, it's a lot of you, Mr. Bill. But he said, I, 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 I said, I know old Jones goes down there and he ain't nothing. He shoots craps at me over there. I said, that's all right, Gabe. See? That's all right. But remember, Jones has to answer for that. You don't have to, you see? If you just go, I said, you got a good pastor. Oh, Pastor Jones is one of the finest men is in the country. I said, let him be your example if you can't look farther than that. Let him be your example. So one day, Brother Jones said, took old Gabe hunting. 
said, we had got more rabbits and birds that day than we could partly pack. I said, come in the evening. He said, old Gabe has come behind. Oh, they all loaded down, you know, like that. His wife was a real loyal Christian. She had a place right there, a Holy Ghost filled woman. And she always had her post of duty. So he was, old Gabe is coming behind, you know. And Pastor Jones said, he looked around. You see old Gabe kept looking over his shoulder like that, the sun setting. They're getting real low, getting cool. So that's why he said, walking along, said, old Gabe come up and he had his shotgun barrel hanging full of rabbits and birds and things. Said so he tapped the pastor on the shoulder and said, Pastor? They turned around and said, Yeah, Gabe, what's the matter? Say, look, great big tears run off of his black cheeks where his beard was turning gray. He says, Pastor, I've been walking along this bank here for about a half hour. Said, I've been watching that sun go down. Said, you know, these gray whiskers of mine and my hair turning, said, you know, my sun's setting too, Pastor. Said, that's right, Gabe. He just stopped and turned around. So what's the matter with you? He said, my son's setting too. I said, you know what? I said, I got to thinking. He said, as I was walking along back there, he said, you know, I said, the Lord must love me. I said, sure he does, Gabe. I said, you know, I'm a poor shot, so I couldn't hit nothing. But I said, we, we really needed this meat at home. He said, just look at the big, fine bunch of game that he gave me, these birds and these rabbits. He said, I got enough to keep us all next week. I said, he must have loved me because I can't hit nothing, you know. I couldn't hit it. But just look what he gave me. They said, he must love me or he wouldn't have given me this. I said, that's right. He said, well, I had a strange little knock at my door down there. He told me to turn around. I said, Gabe, your son's setting too. I said, Pastor, you know what I've done, Pastor? He said, I made him a promise. He said, Gabe, I want to ask you something. I said, what sermon did I preach that made you feel that way? He said, Pastor, or said, now wait a minute. He said, what, what, what choir sing? He said, oh, I sure do love that singing in that church, Pastor. He said, I love every message you preach because it comes right from that good book, and I know it's right. But said, it wasn't that. He said, he just knocked, and I looked around here to see how good he was to me, what he gave me. He said, Sunday morning, I was going to walk right up in front there where you standing. He said, I'm going to give you my right hand. He said, but because I done give my heart to the Lord right down around the hill there. He said, I was going to be baptized and take my place right beside of my wife. And I'm going to stay there until the Lord calls me higher. See, he just happened to look around and see how good God had been to him. I'm a missionary. If you could look out through the eyes that I'm looking through now and see an Indian place some little hungry people, mothers starving on the street, their little kids can't even cry no more from hunger. And just think of what we had here today. Look at the cars you come in. Look at the clothes you're wearing. Look how rich you are. Friend, can't you feel that little knock there somewhere? That's right. Let us pray. With our heads bowed and our hearts, as the minutes now are fleeting, of about seven minutes until midday, my brother, sister, science tells us it's less than three minutes until midnight. Now, if you can just look around, and just think for a minute, your little children sitting there by you, how many little spastics? Look at your nice wife, brother, and think how many men that's worth millions of dollars and loves a woman with all of his heart. She's a barfly. He'd give his cold million to have a, that woman to love him the way your life, wife loves you. And you, wife, how many women, how many mothers here this morning with their little children? How many fathers? Why, my, is a many man looking at a crib, a little old, drawn up, poor little thing, crippled, and looking at what fine little children you got. Many little old, maybe, oh God, there's so many things if you just look. He's been so good to us Americans. Now can't you just feel that you'd like to have a little salve this morning? Open my eyes just a little farther, Lord. Open my eyes. As our sister so lovely saying, his eye is on the sparrow, just a little sparrow. And I know he watches me. Now, he's watching right at you now. Can you, 
just hear down somewhere a little knock like this. I'm visiting this morning. It's the greatest honor you could ever be paid if you can feel that knocking at your heart. Will you just raise your hand and say, by this, Lord, by your help and your grace, to, from the day on, I'll live as close to you as I know how to live. That's all I know how to ask you. God bless you. God bless you. By your help and grace, today, from today on, I'll never forget this. Lo, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, I remember, where was he knocking? At the barn? No. At the bar? No. Where is he knocking? At the church. If any man will hear my voice and open unto me, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Dear God, this little broken, mixed up few words that's been said this morning, somehow let the Holy Spirit interpret them to the hearts of the people. Now, there was many, Lord. Maybe out of this hundred here was 20 or 30 people raised their hands. I have no way of knowing just what they needed, Lord. But I know that midday is just a few minutes off, and so is the coming of the Lord. Yet before the snow melts from the ground, we may be summoned, and this may be the moment that will change the whole future of whether they be left here or go up. Dear God, humbly, we accept Jesus. We accept all of his words. Fill us, Lord. Fill us with the Holy Spirit that our lives just automatically would bear the fruit. Grant it, Lord. Forgive us of our many mistakes. Oh, we are so full of them, Lord. And we have nothing that we can offer, Lord. Because everything that we got, you give it to us. As Gabe said in the little story we just told, you, you sure love us, Lord, or you wouldn't do this. And I think these people have sat here since early this morning, sitting here since 8 o'clock. There's four hours that they sit in here. They love you, Lord. They love you. Now, Father, will you just send the salve of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes. May we, these who are here in the city, may they rush to that revival tonight. May there be such an outpouring, grant it, Lord. May an old-fashioned revival start here in the city, grant it. Bless every man that's putting forth, every one of your servants throughout the world is putting forth an effort. Be with them, Lord, and help them. Open our eyes that we might see more and more the likeness of Christ. Grant it, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. And now these who raise their hands, Father, I commit them to you. Receive them. Now, I quote thy own word, Lord, which heavens and earth will fail, but you said, He, which is a personal pronoun, He that heareth my words. Lord, they might have been broke up and simple, but somebody heard them. The seed fell. He that heareth my words and, conjunction, believeth on him that sent me, because he did this, he hath, present tense, everlasting life and shall not in the future come to the judgment but's past from death unto life. They raise their hands, Lord. They broke those. Every scientific law, gravitation holds our hands down. But they prove that there's a spirit in them that could listen to a knock at the door and reach out with their right hand towards heaven to open the door. Open, Lord, and come in. We are yours. Receive us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I love Just close our eyes just a moment. Now from our hearts with our hands up. 
accepting your knock this morning, Lord. My hands are up. All of our hands are up, Lord. And now come in, Lord Jesus. Come into our hearts and sup with us. And we'll sup with thee. Calvary's tree. The loving Oh, I think he's so wonderful, don't you? Don't you feel his presence just kind of scouring you out? I feel real religious right now. Just feel real good, something in my My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, say. you when we hum this next verse of that beautiful hymn, the old hymn of the church. I want to shake hands with somebody. Just remain your seat. Just say, God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. So glad to be with you here. Let's do that. Presbyterians. Now, as we sing slowly now uh, to them the bottom of your heart, you know, after a scouring, scolding message, I think it's good to get in the Spirit and sing. The sweetness of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how sweet it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The Bible said it's like the anointing oil was on Aaron's beard that run down to the hems of his skirts. You're wonderful people up here. I hope to get back to see you again before Jesus calls me or the millennium. If I don't, I'll see you across the river over there. I'll meet you at the river. Amen. It's an appointment. While life's dark may I tread and grief around me spread. Be thou my guide. Be darkness turn to day. That little light you talked about. White sorrows, fears away. Just touch the little button and watch them all go right around the circle and say, Come in, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord. All. Oh, let me from this day. Now let you stand at the door. Be all. You that raise your hands and wants to be farther led towards the Lord, I ask you to go down to the revival tonight. And I'm sure the pastor there would take you from here to the inn. He has 
sixpence or whatever was given to take care of wine and oil to pour in, he can finish the job. God bless you. Now, I'll turn the service back to, I guess, Brother Williams or everybody.